Alright, welcome back to Introductory Psychology. We are now transitioning from Chapter 3 on Sensation and Perception into our Chapter uh, chapter 4, obviously the next chapter, and this is um, a chapter on consciousness. So it is a shorter chapter, um, but I, to me, I think it's one of the most interesting and fascinating chapters we cover in this, in this course. It's somewhat of an abstract concept. Um, and, and consciousness, um, and there are a lot of different ideas and theories behind consciousness that we'll look at, but I, I think this is one of the more interesting chapters that we talk about. Um, so let's get started. These are the learning outcomes. By the time the chapter is over, you should be able to define what consciousness is. Um, broadly speaking, a state of consciousness. This, and you know, really, I can, I'm kind of giving the answer away now. But when you see that word consciousness, you should start to mentally replace it with awareness. That's sort of the, the really short definition of consciousness is awareness. Uh, we're going to look at some various states of consciousness, including sleep. So at the end of this chapter, you'll be able to explain the nature of sleep and different sleep disorders. Uh, you'll also we're going to take a look at hypnosis, meditation, biofeedback training. Uh, and how those are used for altering states of consciousness. Uh, then we're going to switch gears and look at substance abuse disorders. We're going to look at, um, and this includes legal and illegal drugs. Most of the drugs that we're going to talk about, uh, that, that when we talk about substance use, we're talking about anything that alters consciousness. And, and again, it does not have to be legal or illegal uh, to, to be something that can alter your consciousness. In fact, the world's most widely consumed drug is perfectly legal to consume. And, and many of you who have are watching this video have consumed this drug already. It's caffeine. Most of us don't start our day without caffeine. It, uh, it obviously affects our behavior. It obviously affects the way we think and the way we behave. So, um, so yeah. Anyways, let's move on. We'll talk about that more. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it all up front. Uh, and then we're going to look at we're going to look at some different classifications of of drugs. Again, both legal and illegal. We're going to look at depressants, uh, stimulants, and then finally hallucinogenic drugs. So three broad classifications of drugs, and we'll look at how they affect uh, behavior and how they affect mental processes. Uh, here are the truth or uh, truth or fiction questions or statements that you should uh, check your own comprehension as we go through. If you'd like, go ahead and pause the video now and maybe check your comprehension. Go ahead and pre you know check yourself before we dive into the chapter, and then as we go through the chapter, see how close you are to uh, uh, getting these these truth or fiction questions correct. Okay, so let's review just very briefly before we stop. Um, take a couple of moments to jot some thoughts down about this, this statement or this question. Describe the difference between top-down and bottom-up processing. Go ahead and uh, pause the video, jot some things down, and come back whenever you're finished. Okay, cool. Welcome back. Um, when you talked about top-down and, and bottom-up processing from Chapter 3, you know, you should have, I think the example that I gave is listening to a song. You know, when you hear a song for the first time, you're initiating bottom-up processing. You're having to use, it's a very sensory-driven experience, meaning uh, you're relying on your ears solely to hear the song and know the song. Because at this point, you don't know it. You don't know the words, you don't know the beats or the music to kind of follow along with. So you're building that experience from the bottom up. Whereas maybe you've heard, after you've heard the song 20 times on the radio and to the point where you can sing it, you can rehearse it or whatever without even, you know, without even the song being on, you're using top-down processing. And this is much more cognitive driven. This is much more, this is more of the perception aspect of sensation and perception. So an easy way of a rule of thumb, and I don't think I mentioned this in the last video, I'm sorry for if I didn't, bottom-up processing is sensation. And top-down processing is perception. It's you know this is where we're building the experience using our sensory or our sensory apparatus. This is where we're using cognition to fill you know to to generate that experience. Okay, so what is consciousness? Let's move out of chapter three and into chapter four. What is consciousness? Again, I, I cannot stress this enough. If you wanted to sum up consciousness in one word, it, it is simply awareness. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna tease tease it out a little more than just simply awareness. It's Part of it is sensory awareness, just awareness of your environment. And the fact that we have this conscious awareness allows us to selectively attend to certain things in our environment. We can tune into some things and tune out other things. You know, when you're, when you're staring at your phone and playing on your phone, and, and instead of paying attention in class or paying attention, you know, during a, a, an important meeting, you're using selective attention. You are directing your conscious awareness to your phone rather than say to your boss in the meeting or to your teacher in the in, in during instruction. Um, this is a part of self-control. You know, some of us are really good at controlling our attention and focusing it on what's important. Some people really struggle with that. You know, that's not always easy, kind of focusing our attention. And we live in a world where it makes it very difficult to sustain attention for long periods of time. 
Um, we'll talk more about that later in the course, but we live in a very interesting time. Um, and, and an interesting phenomenon related to selection of attention is this idea of the cocktail party effect, where you know where we our our sense of awareness is is becomes very sharpened among other people. You know where you can be at a cocktail party, for example, or a party or whatever, a gathering of people, and all of a sudden, you know, you're talking to somebody and you hear your name. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it, the party's loud, but somehow you're able to pick out that your name was just said across the room in an entirely different co uh, um, conversation. We can selectively tune. Sometimes we're really good about the selective attention stuff. Uh, sometimes not so much, but this cocktail party effect kind of shows you uh, the, you know, how, how, you know, the sharpness that, that this exerts sometimes. Um, again, you know, it's, it's awareness of the environment, but it's also awareness of self. Consciousness is, is, is not only knowing kind of what's going on around you, but also what's going on within you. What are your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, you know, that sort of that metacognitive ability to, to self-assess yourself. Like, hey, I'm, I'm feeling anxious right now. Oh, I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling happy. Just being self-aware. So it's two parts, awareness of self and awareness of the environment or others. Now, Freud, we talked about Freud, I think, in chapters one, uh, chapter one. I don't think we talked about him much since then, but Freud believed that we, uh, consciousness, human consciousness, uh, or the mind, is divided into three parts. We have the pre-conscious, and this is the things that we are not necessarily aware of, but they can become uh, readily available to our awareness pretty easily. So, for example, you probably forget the feeling of your clothes on your body as you go throughout the day. But now that I've said something about it, now you're aware. Oh, I feel my clothes. I feel warm. Like my jacket feels warm or my socks feel warm on my feet or my pants feel, you know, uh, they feel tight or they feel loose or whatever. You know, you don't think about those things until somebody brings it to your awareness. Now, the unconscious, according to Freud, is where it's totally outside of our awareness. It is not readily available. It's completely outside of our, our um our, our, our consciousness. And in fact, Freud, be Freud believed that, um, you know, we in fact repress certain things. We try to push things down into this unconscious portion of our mind uh, in order to alleviate feelings of anxiety, guilt, or shame, or anything, any negative emotions like that. Um, the unconscious, you know, again, also another way of doing this is, you know, could be suppression or repression, you know, just rejecting or rejecting certain thoughts. Um, non-conscious would be, this is not the same thing as being as unconscious. This is, you know, these are bodily processes that cannot be experienced through sensory awareness. Um, so not, not quite the same. You, you might hear sometimes the two terms used interchangeably, but they're really not. If we're talking about Freud, they really are not to be used interchangeably. Um, so, and this is all part of this idea of the developing of the self, these different ideas, these different levels of conscious awareness, according to Freud, is we're, we're going to spend a whole other chapter talking about personality and self and things like that. So I don't want to belabor the point too much, but I just want you to know that according to Freud, all this stuff is integrated into our sense of self. Um, yeah, we have a waking state, which is sort of outside of these different, you know, outside of these pre-conscious, unconscious, non-conscious, things like that. Um... And again, you know, this is coming up. I, I think we won't talk about this too much right now, but um, personality, some, some theorists in psychology, especially those like Freud or like uh, Maslow, you know, co consciousness is, is essentially our self. It's all of these things, you know, all of these things, our impressions, our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, all of these things that come together to form what we call our self. And we will talk more about that, this concept of the self now, but I just kind of want, I'm just trying to introduce these ideas and show maybe where consciousness sort of fits in. Uh, let's look at some altered states of consciousness. We are not going to spend too much time on um, any one of these, but we're briefly going to look at you know some of these. You know, um, uh, we're going to look at sleep, meditation, hypnosis, and then finally um, perceptions that are altered by drugs. Again, both legal and illegal. So for this first video, we're going to focus mainly on sleep. Um, and sleep is determined by our body's circadian rhythm. The body has numerous circadian rhythms. Um, it's not just connected to sleep. We have, um, you know, hormones operate on a circadian rhythm. Basically, it's just, circadian rhythm just means a 24-hour cycle. It's not necessarily exclusively tied to sleep, but that's mostly what people think about it as. Um, interesting is there's some research that suggests that if, if we were, you know, left to our devices and our circadian rhythm would actually operate on a 25-hour scale instead of 24 hours, um, so, you know, when we don't, when we, when we rely so heavily on other cues, you know, in our environment, like alarm clocks and things like that, you know, 
we we don't quite na operate on our the natural sort of circadian rhythm we should but obviously it's not that far off going from 24 to 25 hours uh, more on on um, circadian rhythm our body will go through a series of stages about every 90 minutes um, during sleep and I'll outline those on the next slide or two so don't worry about that yet but just know that in the brain this is being regulated by uh, this this is a, a mouthful. I promise you it's not too bad, but it's the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this is, a, this is what stimulates the pineal, pineal gland in your brain to produce melatonin. Again, melatonin is that chemical that makes you want to go to sleep. It's what your body naturally produces whenever you, know, you start turning out the lights or when the sun goes down. Your body, it's the signal to your body to know it's time for rest. Uh, again, melatonin promotes sleep. Sorry, I forgot to illustrate that. Um, you know, you've heard the saying, human beings, we need about eight hours of sleep. Well, that is definitely more than some species, and it's definitely far less than other species. You know, for example, bats sleep nearly 20 hours a day. Your cat at home, you know, your cat Fluffy at home only sleeps, I say only, sleeps about 15 hours a day. You know, I, you know, talk about jealousy, man. I'm, I feel lucky to get seven hours of sleep. Some days I, I couldn't imagine getting 14 or 18 or 20 hours. Uh, whereas cows and sheep and goats, it looks like farm animals don't get quite as much. Maybe there's something to do with working on a farm. I don't know. Uh, but humans, we're right here, eight hours. And that eight hours is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a good number, but it's not for everybody. Um, some people really need eight hours. Some people need less. Some people need more. I'm the kind of person that as long as I get about six hours of sleep, I'm good. I like to get six to eight hours of sleep, um, but I rarely get more than eight. That is a tie that is so rare for me ever to get more than eight. And it's actually rare that I can even stay asleep for eight hours, even if I have the time. Uh, my body is just so attuned. And maybe you'll notice that of yourself as you get older that maybe you don't quite need to sleep as much. Uh, our brain operates on different frequencies um, at different stages of sleep. You know, notice how, you know, we're awake, we're operating on these beta waves, they're, they're low amplitude, but high frequency, meaning our brain is alert. Uh, however, we start to transition into alpha waves as we get drowsier, we have higher amplitude, but the frequency is slowing down, our thoughts are slowing down, maybe they're kind of spiking, maybe a little bit of intensity, but they're slowing down, and then we're asleep. And we move into stage one, which is theta waves. Uh, we are technically asleep. It's a very, it's not a very deep sleep. Uh, stage two, we move into stage two over time. This is called we experience sleep spindles. These are kind of like random spikes or, uh, or, or of, of neurological activity. Um, stage three, we're entering the delta waves. This is getting into the, the, the deeper sleep. Uh, stage three and four are the deepest stages of sleep. Uh, and then this is called non-REM. REM sleep is its own stage, is rapid eye movement where you can literally see somebody's eyes fluctuating behind their head. Um, and this is the stage where you're most likely to experience dreaming or remember your dreams. You can you dream at all stages, um, but you're more likely to remember it. It's more likely to be visual, so where you remember it. And we go through all four of these stages, you know, about every 90 minutes throughout the night. And I think there's a graph on the next slide. Yeah, so we go through it on an eight-hour night. You know, we typically go through about five cycles of the stage. You know, we or we go through the stage. You know, four to five times. Um, you know, our first time we go through the cycle is typically the deepest and longest, and it gets shorter and shorter as we go through. We actually spend less time in those deep stages of sleep and spend more time in REM as we as we sleep longer in the night. Um, yeah, your last REM period may last for about thirty minutes. But here is the stage. So you're awake. One, two, three, four. Three, two, REM. One, two, three, four. Now, just, now notice the four. Look at the gray, the gray, uh, the, sorry, the gray. The blue here, uh, it's shrinking. Notice we're not spending very much time in four. Notice by the time we're in, you know, three or four in the morning, we're not spending any time in that really deep sleep. In fact, we're spending more time in REM as things go on. And that is the sweet stuff according to most sleep research. REM sleep is, sleep is about not only getting quality of sleep, or quantity, excuse me, you want to get your eight hours, obviously, or however many you need, but you also want to get quality, and REM is the quality. That is where the good stuff happens, and we'll talk about in an, another slide. Uh, so these are the functions of sleep. Uh, rejuvenate your body. It helps you recover from stress. It helps you consolidate learning. You know, one of the best things you can do after reading or, or learning or studying is to get a good night's sleep. Let your mind literally digest it. Well, not literally digest it, but let your mind sort of cognitively digest things. 
Uh, and also infants, there's a lot of research that shows that infants sleep a lot and it's part of their brain development. There's a reason why infants in that first year, they may sleep, you know, 12 plus hours a day, especially when they're really, really young, young children. Um, it's part of this brain development. So a lot of benefits of sleeping, a lot of benefits, a lot of functions for sleeping. Again, um, the amount of sleep is, it's, we, we say eight hours, but that is different for everybody. It may, your, the amount that you require may be determined genetically. Um, if you're under stress, you may need more sleep. Obviously, sometimes when you're stressed, it's hard to get sleep. So that's really interesting. And then there is this kind of, you know, there is a belief or an assumption that the older we get, the less, the less sleep we require. And, and that might be to physical discomfort. It might be to, you know, we have more in our minds as adults. I mean, there's a lot of factors involved, but, you know, talk to your grandparents, talk to your parents. Um, if they are still alive and you can talk to them, ask them, how has your sleep changed? Because I noticed that my grandma, you know, my grandma and grandpa, they're both, they're both alive. Uh, both sets of grandparents are alive, thankfully. But I, one of my grandparents, I, I, every time I talk to her on the phone or every year, it seems like, uh, she wakes up earlier and earlier and earlier. Nowadays, I think she's getting up around two or three in the morning. Uh, you know, my grandpa still sleeps in quite a bit, but you know, she is something about as she's gotten older, she just gets up earlier and earlier. The need for sleep is just not as much. Um, so Again, we mentioned this on the previous slide that um, that uh, sleep is connected to memories. It's connected to learning. Um, you know, when we don't have REM sleep, research shows that we just don't learn as efficiently. We're le it takes us longer to learn the same amount of material, and we're more likely to forget. And also the brain, it's kind of starved for REM sleep. In fact, it'll go into what's known as REM rebound, where you're, it's almost like when you fall asleep, your body will try to get to REM as fast as possible to make up for the lack of REM sleep, the deprivation of REM sleep. So again, quantity and quality are both important, but especially quality when we're talking about REM. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here. I wanted to stop at sleep. I didn't wanna overwhelm you with too much. I wanted your brain to have the chance to digest some stuff. So we're gonna stop here. When we pick back up, we're gonna jump into meditation, um, hypnosis, and I think biofeedback, and then we'll, you know, we'll switch, we'll transition into uh, drugs. So that's really it for this video. Uh, tune in next time and we'll pick up in chapter four. Thanks.